In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program. Myself, Martin Blackham. Great to have you with us. This is the program that looks at Israel and the end times. And we also look at the news and feature guests, important uh, people from the nation of Israel who can give us an insight into what is happening in uh, Israel today. Now, the, the newspaper, I've got the Jerusalem Post uh, from uh, a few days ago, and you can see these terrible headlines. Four rabbis killed in Jerusalem synagogue massacre. Uh, and that just happened a few days ago. So there has been a wave of terror uh, in Israel as, as we're coming on to broadcast. And we've got Dr. Martin Sherman in the studio today. Great to have you with us, Martin. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. So much for coming in today. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Sherman is originally from South Africa. He's lived in Israel since 1971. He served for seven years in an operational uh, capacity in the Israeli defense establishment. Uh, was a ministerial advisor to Yitzhak Shamir, lectured for 20 years at Tel Aviv University uh, in political science, international relations, and strategic studies. He's authored two books. Uh, he's a writer for the Jerusalem Post. Those who of you, uh, our viewers who read the Jerusalem Post, I know that you've seen him there, and he's spoken on BBC, CNN, and I24. He's the founder and CEO of the In Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, and he's coming into the studio today to really give us an insight as to what's happening. So, first of all, Martin, um, uh, maybe we can start with this uh, story, the four rabbis killed in the Jerusalem synagogue, and maybe you can just uh, talk us through that and maybe some of, um, some of your thoughts on, on what's happening at the moment. Well, um, on the Friday before the, the incident that you described, I wrote an article in my column called On the Cusp of Carnage, and uh, unfortunately, the Tuesday after that, uh, w the carnage was upon us. Um, I think in many ways, this is a culmination of an ongoing process. Now, I think what's happened over the years is that a, a stance which Israel has taken has not really been resolute or assertive enough in dealing with this. And this sense of vacillation and reticence has emboldened uh, Israel's enemies and uh, I think could easily fan the flames of a new and very, very deadly wave of terror which is perpetrated by individuals, not necessarily within an organizational uh, framework, but is promoted and, uh, and uh, uh, encouraged by uh, Arab leaders in the Palestinian Authority, in Hamas, and beyond the borders. So I think in this very firm action is taken to quell this uh, budding in, uh, insurrection, we could be in for a very serious uh, future with uh, uh, unfortunate bloodshed on a wide scale. And we've, we've um, seen that there's been a decrease in Israel because of the construction of the uh, the wall, what's known as the wall, but actually is mostly a fence. Um, we've seen a decrease in the amount of terror, but I, I, I saw some people had written that these are people who actually live the other side of the fence. That's the, yeah. the problem that yeah. we're dealing with a, a, in a, 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 an Arab population that's been placed on, on this side of the fence. Uh, and um, uh, with, the, with the ISIS, uh, they're seeing things happening and, and it's encouraging them. Uh, and the problem is with the mosques to, to um, carry out atrocities. Well, I agree with you. I think there's a symbiotic relation uh, between the Arab populations on both sides of the pre-67 Green Line. And uh, when Israel behaves in a manner which is, in my opinion, too concessionary in external events, it creates the impression that uh, uh, it will behave at, uh, in, in a similar manner in, internally. 
And so that basically encourages uh, aggression inside the Green Line because they've seen it working outside the Green Line when Israel retreats, when Israel uh, uh, makes concessions on the one side of the Green Line. The message is uh, pressure pays off. And uh, therefore, basically, you're, you're, you're uh, inviting pressure inside the Green Line. And uh, I, I think the, the, the greater weakness, the greater concessionary policies that Israel adopts, it uh, will not satiate the appetite for further concessions, but just wet appetite, or just wet appetites for, for more concessions. And we're also seeing, uh, with the war in, uh, the recent uh, war in Gaza, we're also seeing um, anti-Israelism, which um, it seems to me is more anti-Semitism than uh, anti-Israel. In other words, uh, people who are uh, protesting about Israel's actions against Hamas and uh, in the war uh, that's just taken place in Gaza. So do, do you think that's a phenomenon as well, that anti people who are saying that they're against Israel, but really what they're saying is that they're anti-Semitic? Well, you know, people often say that uh, criticism of Israel is not uh, anti-Semitism. And there's a certain amount of truth to this. But the enduring application of double standards to the Jewish state makes anti-Semitism an increasingly plausible explanation. Because uh, if you look at the way that other democracies behave in wars which threaten their population far less than the events here threaten the Israeli population. For instance, NATO's behavior in Kosovo. If you listen then to the uh, uh, NATO spokesman, uh, Jamie O'Shea, explaining the uh, occurrence of civilian casualties in Serbia, it was exactly what Israel says, that uh, you know, they were, weren't target, targeting civilians, but civilians are unfortunate collateral damage when military operations take place. With, uh, in, in, in Kosovo, for instance, uh, uh, it was far more blatant because there weren't uh, uh, precision uh, bombing raids. There were high-altitude bombing raids, which was by definition couldn't have been uh, accurate. And they hit uh, uh, hospitals and old-age homes and even the Chinese embassy and uh, uh, fleeing uh, refugees and uh, buses crossing ravines, etc., etc. So there were some horrific incidents of, of uh, NATO causing uh, civilian casualties in the, in the war in the Balkans, but it attracted very little public criticism. The same thing in Afghanistan and in, and in Iraq. There have been massive civilian casualties. Uh, I, I think there's a very telling interview, I think it was Leslie Stahl, 60 Minutes, interviewing Madeleine Albright before she became Secretary of State. I think she was then uh, ambassador at the UN. And uh, she, uh, uh, she was asked about the number of Iraqi babies who had died as a result of uh, US-led UN sanctions on Iraq. And apparently something like an order of magnitude of the number of children who were killed in Hiroshima died as a result of sanctions on Iraq. And she was asked, do you think it was worth it? And she said, yes. Now, I can just imagine the, the outcry there would have been had an Israeli said anything vaguely approaching that kind of callousness uh, you know, it, it, there, would have, there would have been a, a storm in, 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 in the international media. And so, you know, when you say, is criticism of Israel anti-Semitism? Well, you, know, you can make a case that certain substantive elements of Israeli policy can be criticized, but no one is capable of, of, zero, uh, of, of, of zero errors. But the enduring application of double standards to the action of the Jewish state, which will not apply to anyone else, uh, make anti-Semitism uh, an increasingly plausible explanation for this. Now, uh, one of the things that um, you've been talking about recently is the rethinking of Palestine, the, the two-state solution. And I know a lot of our viewers will be very interested in this, that um, the, the plausibility of a two-state solution and the whole, the whole thing. So maybe, maybe we could talk about that. Um, and uh, I know that you've done the a presentation, uh, which maybe the viewers will be able to get hold of, and maybe we'll be able to find out how the link for that. Um, maybe we can talk a bit about that, about Sherlock Holmes and the this presentation you've done um, to help people to understand this uh, this very important issue. Because 
the thing is, Martin, the two-state solution is presented as a, as a fait accompli, that it's almost as if it's, there's no other alternatives and there's, this is just the only way for Israel to go forward. Oh, well, you know, I, I agree that I'm very skeptical about the two-state solution because the two-state solution is not really a two-state solution. It's a two-stage solution in which the Arabs try to prize Israel loose of critically important strategic assets and then from these improved positions uh, move forward to the next stage, which will be the total elimination of the Jewish nation state. But um, for Israel to endure as the nation state of the Jewish people, it has to address two imperatives. The one imperative is a geographic imperative, so it can remain uh, a defensible entity. And the second is the demographic uh, imperative that it can maintain its Jewish majority. Now, in addressing these two imperatives, it faces two deadly dangers. The one is the two-state solution, which, as I'll explain uh, a little later, does not address adequately the geographic imperative. And the one-state solution, which is being bandied about as the default solution if you do not uh, implement a two-state solution, doesn't adequately address the demographic uh, imperative. Now, why does the two-state solution not address the uh, geographic uh, imperative adequately? Well, from the territory that has been designated for a Palestinian state, for the second state in the two-state solution, you control virtually everything of any strategic value within the pre-67 uh, uh, Green Line. That means uh, airfields, military and uh, civilian, including Ben Gurion Airport, the only uh, um, international airport that Israel has. It means uh, seaports and naval bases. It means uh, important uh, infrastructure installations and systems like power, water, etc., etc. The whole land transport system, um, whether it's a road or rail. In fact, the uh, Trans-Israel Highway, Highway 6, would run adjacent to the border for a, a great portion of its, of its length, north to south. Uh, it means uh, uh, important uh, uh, population centers, centers of government, military command, and 80% of the population and 80% of the commercial activity. All of these will be within range of weapons being used today from territory evacuated by Israel, uh, including in allegedly demilitarized areas like Gaza. Now, this can no longer be dismissed as right-wing scaremongering because it's the empirical precedent. And uh, this is a situation which would make any uh, socioeconomic routine within the coastal plain, within 80% of the population and 80% of the commercial activity, almost impossible to maintain because it, it could be disrupted at will by anyone sitting in the high, gr in the high ground above the, 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 coast, the, the coastal plain. I think many people don't know that the area designated for a Palestinian state is a range of uh, limestone hills uh, which rise up from the, co the, the coastal plain towards the west and then drop steeply down into the Jordan Valley. And anyone who controls that controls the total uh, complex of life, socioeconomic life within Israel. Um, and uh, even if you happen to find a Palestinian who is sincere and uh, actually means to implement the agreement that he uh, signs, um, there's no guarantee that he will stay in power. Uh, and again, this is not scaremongering. This is what was the, the, the president in Gaza. So whether he's removed by the ballot or by the bullet, uh, it makes no difference. You could find yourself in a situation that the area that you've handed over to some allegedly moderate, uh, peace-loving uh, partner uh, is now fallen into the hands of uh, radical extremists, uh, jihadists, uh, some sort of affiliate of uh, Al-Qaeda or of, or of ISIS. Uh, and these elements, because of the successes uh, uh, 
elsewhere uh, have become more and more inf uh, influential among Arab populations on both sides of the Green Line. And uh, you, you, the population <coughs> is so close to the territory, which we don't, which uh, a lot of our viewers won't understand this, but uh, if there is a Palestinian state, it'll be so close uh, for populations, and they can see it they literally from the top of the mountain where the, the state will be, can see Ben Gurion, can see the um, uh, can see the, air, uh, the the airport and and Tel Aviv and all of the important things. And we've seen from the war in um, in uh, Gaza that uh, with missiles, you don't ne you don't need to be very far away to cause major major havoc and destruction. Well, I think you know one of the lessons of the last war in Gaza was. Uh, the effectiveness of short-range mortars, which uh, um, were very effective, and the uh, the Iron Dome, which stopped a lot of the the longer-range and medium-range uh, rockets, uh, had great difficulty in in intercepting mortars. Now, we saw in the in the last war what the, what the the, the 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 significance was of a short border, 50 kilometers long, abutting or sparsely populated rural south. Now imagine that you have a 500 kilometer border abutting your heavily populated urban center with your only international airport uh, within mortar range of the border and your, your Trans-Israel Highway within reach of tunnels underneath the border. Uh, that, that, that's a situation that could easily make life in Israel totally unlivable. And the consequences both for Israelis and Palestinians because of the harshness of the Israeli reaction that would be would be horrific. You know, it's 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 a recipe for 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 large scale bloodshed. And we've seen we've seen the recently we've seen the United Nations abandon their post in, in, on the border in the Golan, and now we have uh, uh, some people was are saying ISIS is on the border, and we have um, uh, in Syria we have ISIS pretty much. Uh, I know it's under attack now, uh, but uh, pretty much establishing itself there. And um, it's interesting that, uh, Martin, they were talking, the, uh, there was one proposal about the United Nations being involved with the, uh, with the two-state solution, with the Palestinian state. But we see the, the fact that they, you know, they abandon their, their posts at the, at the slightest um, uh, threat. Well, I, I think it's very unreasonable to expect uh, any international forces who have not really got the commitment to the people that they're protecting to show the necessary resolve and determination to withstand any attack by determined uh, jihadis or, or, or uh, radical uh, extremists. And, and, and in fact, I think what you're seeing in, in, in Sinai is even the Egyptian army, who has got a far greater stake in, in imposing law and order than, uh, uh, than any international force would have, um, having great difficulty in dealing with uh, the, the groups there. Recently, one has just declared uh, its allegiance to, uh, to, uh, to ISIS. So you, you have this brewing violence and radical extremism and, and jihadism brewing all around Israel. You have it, the Shiite version in Lebanon after the uh, mismanaged Second uh, Lebanese War in 2006. You have things brewing in Syria with the possibility of a border with ISIS or some uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate. Uh, you have a very wobbly regime in, uh, in Jordan, and, and even if it doesn't topple, it may be dominated or, or heavily influenced by, by Islamic uh, forces, which would make the, 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 the establishment of a, of a Palestinian state abutting that even more imbecilic, because then you would have this huge territory or track of, of, of Islamic controlled uh, land from virtually the fringes of greater Tel Aviv to, to, to the border of Iraq and beyond. Um, and uh, then you have in uh, Gaza, of course, the, the uh, resurgent Hamas uh, after, the, after the war, uh, being challenged by even more uh, radical elements. And uh, Sinai descending into perhaps in many Somaliland, which is one, one, you know, one of the most brutal and cruel places in, in, in the world. And so, uh, you know, unless and, and Israel really adopts a far more resolute 
and assertive stance than it has as, as, uh, uh, than it has up to now, I can see a perfect storm brewing against it. Um, I mean, that's <coughs> one of the criticisms of Israel has been its, um, and uh, some of, some of our viewers will be aware of this, and uh, for you watching at home, that um, Israel hasn't really been forthright in 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 um, its public diplomacy in um, in stating its case. There hasn't been um, a co even coordination, I guess, would be a, a, a good way of putting it, that the, it just seems that Israel is on the back foot when trying to explain its position. Yes, well, I think Israel's public diplomacy is a catastrophic failure. Um, I, I don't know if you've got enough time to go into the reasons for it, but, uh, um, you, you know, I've, I've written about what I've called the limousine theory. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is very important to understand because you have a strange phenomenon in, in Israel where you have regularly right-wing hawkish parties or right-wing or, or parties who, who uh, uh, offer the voter uh, right-wing hawkish uh, platforms regularly winning elections and on being elected they immediately adopt the failed policies of the defeated dovish uh, uh, leftists. Now, this, this is very strange because you have you know, sort of the right-wing hawks consistently winning elections and never getting into power. Now, you know, there, 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 uh, there could be a number of ways to, to explain this. Some people might say it's international pressure. But international pressure doesn't really cut it because two of them, the, 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 the most important processes that took part in the last two and a half decades, the Oslo process and the disengagement, w weren't the product of international pressure. They were product of, Isra of Israeli initiatives. Uh, the, the, the Oslo process was brewed up by, by Israelis, and the, the uh, disengagement, the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza, was something that Arik Sharon not only dreamed up, but virtually imposed on his party against the will of the majority. So international pressure can't explain that. Um, you know, then, then some people say, well, it's the dysfunctional Israeli parliamentary system where you can't really get a big majority. But that's not true either, because none of these processes were, were, were born because of internal coalition pressure. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, sometimes members of coalition resigned in protest against this, and both Rabin and uh, Sharon had to offer uh, uh, political bribery in terms of all sorts of goodies and portfolios in order to broaden the coalition enough to force it through. So, so coalition pressure can't explain it either. And, you, know, you might say there might be some intrinsic wisdom in these dovish policies of, of uh, retreat and concession, but they failed miserably. In fact, they brought about all the dangers that the opponents warned of and none of the benefits that the proponents promised. Um, and so, there's well, Gaza no, being a good example of that. Uh, sure, and so there's there, there there's there's no intrinsic wisdom in this policy. So if it's not international pressure, and it's not coalition pressure, and it's not some intrinsic wisdom in these dovish policies that make the repudiation of hawkish pledges inevitable, it has to be something else. And what it is is Israeli civil society elites, a trinity of civil society elites, interactive elites who have both the ability and the motivation to impose a left-leaning concessionary policy on the government. It doesn't matter who gets elected. Because, you know, you've, you've seen, if you look at Israeli policy over the years, um, since 1977 when the Likud first came to power to 2005 when the Likud withdrew unilaterally um, against its, its, its uh, platform that it offered the voters, that it, that it pledged to the, the voters, uh, there were 28 years. For 20 of them, the Prime Minister came from the ranks of the Likud. When the Likud first came to power as on the platform of, of, of uh, uh, Greater Israel, uh, no one would dare talk about uh, withdrawing from the Jordan Valley, dividing Jerusalem, or evacuating the Golan. Which evacuating the Golan is, a, is sort of you know, not on the agenda anymore, because, not because of anything of Israeli policy, because of the uncontrollable events in Syria. But these were, the, the, these were the positions. And now, dividing Jerusalem, withdrawing from the Jordan Valley, etc., etc., are things that are on the table, which must show you, even though the, the right wing consistently won elections, it never got into power because what was implemented was the left wing dovish uh, uh, policies. 
And as I say, uh, this is basically because of a trinity of interactive civil society elites who can, because of the unelected positions of power, impose on the elected politicians an agenda which is completely divergent from the long-term national interest. Um, and this is why I call it the limousine theory. Why a limousine? Because in a limousine you have a driver in an official uniform and a smart cap and he holds the wheel and sometimes he tilts it left and sometimes he tilts it right and sometimes he accelerates and sometimes he slows down and sometimes he even changes lanes. So he makes a lot of decisions. So the uninformed observer might think he's actually in charge, but he's not. You can change the driver and you might even change the style of driving a little bit. You might even change the, the route slightly, but you won't change the destination. Because the destination is determined by the backseat drivers. And the backseat occupants, in this case, are the civil society elites, a trinity who control the mainstream media, control the legal establishment, and control a large and important part of the Israeli academia. And they can impose on the elected polity, polity a, a, uh, an agenda which is, as I said, completely divergent from the, uh, the, the, the long-term national interest. The people who control the legal establishment can prevent any assertive action being taken by the politicians, whether they want to or not. Um, the people who control, you know, for instance, like cutting off electricity to Gaza so there won't be power that dries the lays that machine the rockets that they fire at us. Uh, the people in the, uh, uh, who control the mainstream media can initiate and promote any concessionary initiative uh, like they did with Oslo, certainly with the disengagement. We've, we've run out of time, Martin. I, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is uh, something that we often face, and uh, thank you so much. We hope to get you in next week on the program, so thank you so much for thank coming you across. For, thank, thank you for having me. Being a, being a guest on the program. Thank you uh, for joining us today. If you'd like uh, further information uh, about uh, Dr. Martin Sherman, there'll be information. We'll make sure that's on the screen. And uh, we... Uh, want you to know that um, your views are very important, so you can email us at info at inthelastdays.com. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter. Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In The Last Days.